how are you? And praise the Lord. Hello, hello, and praise the Lord this Saturday afternoon. I am ready for a nice sort of hope for tomorrow. And I believe that it's going to be a blessing to you and to me. Today I have some quick what I just want to share with you and get out of your way. If you can do me before we begin, if you can just kindly invite for me your friends or create your friends to watch along with you, I would really appreciate it. I hope that I can throw into your spirit, into your heart, that I believe is going to be a blessing to you and I will get out of your way. I'm your host today. As always, Pastor Steve, and I want to share with you briefly something that I believe God prompted in my heart today to share with those who care to listen. So I invite you to invite your friends to watch along with, alongside you, and uh, this word is going to be a blessing to you. If you can invite your friends. Get a watch party. I will be quick. I just want to do what I was taught in public speaking school. You stand up, you speak up, and you shut up. That's what I intend to do today. Just I will just up and will speak up and I will get out of your way. Get out of your way. I'm waiting for you to let me know that you're with me to let me know that you can hear me clearly where you're watching us from invite your friends if you can and then we are ready to begin i no i'm not going to wait long because uh, well you know you're coming so i will just go along and share what it is so glad you could join us today this morning i was looking at my Bible and I was I have some daily portions I read every day and today I was reading somewhere in the book of Corinthians that I picked from the book of Corinthians that uh, was like a spark in my heart that uh, I felt that the inspiration I got from my and uh, I believe it's going to speak to you. There is a scripture that we have often quoted for many years for believers, of course, for Christians who have been Christianity, for believers who have been uh, believers for long. It's a scripture that we know by heart for many people, and that's what I want to refer you to. If you are with me, I would ask of you to go with me to the book of Isaiah. I want to read the book of Isaiah. I will look at chapter 40 of Isaiah, and I will read a couple of verses, not really many, about three or so. I will read Isaiah 40, and I will read from verse 28 to verse 31. Isaiah 40, verse 28 to 31. This is what my Bible says. Verse 28, don't you know, haven't you heard, the Lord is the eternal God. The creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow tired and his understanding cannot be fathomed. Fathomed. Verse 29. He is the one who gives might to the faint. He gives might to the faint. For the powerless. Even young men will grow try tired and weary. I want to change that version. I want to read another different version. Let me read it as I, I like it. I want to read from King James Version. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Verse 30. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31 is what we know by heart, many people know. 
many people who have been in, in Christianity have sung this verse for years. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I will read verse 31 one more time. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. My key interest on that verse and the scriptures that we have read this afternoon is the first part of verse 31. But they that wait, but they that wait upon the Lord, but they that wait upon the Lord. It's a small word there, the word wait, then that is basically what I want to talk to you in the next couple of minutes, and then I will get out of your way. The word is wait, wait. I want to ask you a question. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What are you in wait of? What are you looking forward to? What are you waiting for? That's my message. What are you waiting for? What is it that you are waiting for? The Bible says in Isaiah 40 verse 20 verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall, be, shall, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Now, this is a very important verse and I know we have, like I said, many people have quoted this verse for years. But I want us today, and I don't want to bring you any theological arguments or theological visitation of examining the verse, but I want us to examine that verse today and see what it is we can mine from the Word of God today that would be practical and applicable to our lives to help us become better people, be able to achieve what God expects of us, be able to walk with God, and be able to do what God expects of us to do. And I want to say today that waiting is not something that is uh, pleasant to many people. Especially in the times we live in, people don't like waiting. People don't like being told, wait. People want things done now, if not yesterday. People want things done quick and fast. They want to be solved first. They don't want to be put on hold. They don't want to be told to wait a little. They don't want to be told, uh, uh, wait a minute. They just want to be served now. But when I look at my Bible, I have noticed clearly that waiting is one of the most important Christian discipline that we must cultivate in our lives if we are going to make any wise use of who we are within the time limit God has given us and the resources that he has given us. Waiting is a discipline that every Christian must cultivate in their lives if they are going to be effective and if we are going to be fruitful. We cannot avoid being in a place called waiting bay. Waiting is not something that we want to do or not to do. It is something that we have to do if we are planning to walk and work with God in our lives. And let me say this, that there are things in life you will never attain, you will never get to certain heights and levels in life until you have learned to wait. And God sometimes makes us go through situations in our lives as we grow up so that we can learn in waiting in waiting. There are levels you can never go to. There are attainments you can never achieve. There are breakthroughs you will never have in life until you have been through to a school called waiting. And every Christian who believes in God must learn and must see from the scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, of stories and episodes of men and women whom God promised wonderful things, but they had to wait. For a long time, some had to wait for a day, others had to wait for a month, others had to wait for a year, others had to wait for decades and centuries like the promise 
that God gave to Abraham for his children, said, on this land, I'll give it to your descendants. But they had to wait 430 years plus for them to come and occupy the land that God had already promised. Waiting is not something that we can escape as Christians and as believers. Now, what does waiting do? Now, waiting does two things. One, waiting helps you or trains you to be a sensible person. Waiting helps you and trains you to be a sensible person. You don't just become a mature person today, you're born today and tomorrow. And unfortunately, we have Christians today who have gotten born again today and they want to be performing miracles tomorrow. They have not even learned the art of waiting and walking with God, learning in the school of waiting and developing faith muscle, waiting on God, knowing how God acts and deals with his people, experiencing God in their daily give and take activities and seeing God open doors for them. You have to go through the school called waiting if you are going to be of any any use to the kingdom of God. Don't subscribe to the lie. It's a lie that uh, God is going to give you things like this. Even God is awaiting God. The Bible talks about in the book of Genesis how he waited patiently for Noah to build the ark so that he can save and deliver people. God himself is a patient God. He says he is compassionate. He is patient. He patiently waits for people to repent, to turn away from their wicked ways, to turn away from their rebellion. God waits for people patiently and we would do ourselves a lot of injustice if we cannot cultivate and develop the same discipline that God has shown through and through in the scripture that he is a God who waits. He waits. He will wait for the opportune time to bless someone. He will wait for the particular time he has appointed for you to get to the next level. God is a God who also waits and we must also learn how to wait and how to wait to how to depend on him. The second thing that waiting does is that waiting enables you or it gives you an opportunity to learn how to be dependent on God. It gives you an opportunity to see how inadequate you are and how useless your efforts and activities are and how without him you cannot be anything. So waiting gives you an opportunity to depend on God, to rely on God, to trust him. In fact, the word wait means to, means to look for eagerly. It means to look for eagerly. It also means to hope for. Waiting also means to linger for. It also means to tarry. There is nothing that teaches, teaches you to, to have hope than when you are put in a place where you have to wait and there is nothing else that you can do. So waiting enables you and gives you a platform for you to learn how to depend on God. And let me tell you. There are heights and levels, like I said, you can never get in life with, in, in, you can never get to with God until you learn how to depend on him. Sometimes God will put you in a waiting uh, pattern, in a, in a waiting school, so that you learn that it's not your friends or your neighbors or your families that can help you. For you to learn that if, he is going, if something is going to happen in your life, it is not going to have, it will have nothing to do with you and all what you'll be required to do as a person, as his son, as his daughter, as his child, is just to wait on him. There are some things you will never receive until you learn how to wait. Now, someone said something, and it isn't even a biblical, but it ties into what I'm saying. It is not even Bible. Someone said, be very wary of the, of the fire of a patient man, a man who can patiently wait. Who can wait? Be very wary of that kind of man. For nothing, you tell nothing he purposes or he intends to do will ever escape from his grasp. A man who knows how to wait patiently can have whatever it is that he wants. Now, I want to show you how you should wait. Now, some people wait, but they are actually not waiting in expectation. They are not waiting 
as per what the Bible says we should do when we are waiting. And let me tell you, right now I am sure you could be in a place or situation in life where you don't even understand what's happening. You think you should be in the next level. You think you should be doing this, but you're not doing it. But God has allowed you to be in the situation and the position that you're in right now so that you can learn how to wait on him. But how do you wait on God? Now, there is number one a benefit of waiting on God. We have read in verse 31 that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. If you wait on God for sure, he will refresh you. He will renew your strength. But then, how do you wait on God? Let me show you. I'll give you four po five points on how to wait on God. And I'll be, I'll be gone. Number one. When you wait for God, you must have it in mind. And this should be the attitude that you should have in mind when you're waiting on God. Don't set time limits for God. For God does not do his things and does not run his programs and plans according to our timings. He is above time. He does not live in the time. We, he doesn't live here. He's not a physical being. He lives his spirit. The Bible says God is spirit. So he does not set time by what we do with. Remember, the Bible says a day in the eyes of God is like a thousand years and a thousand years is just like a day before God. So the first thing you must do when you're waiting on God for something, when you're believing God for something, don't you try to think that you can con God and manipulate him by telling him how long you have waited and that he must act by this time or else or else what anyway. He is the God of the universe, the father of all creation. Silver and gold belongs to him. The earth and the fullness thereof, the animals and the beasts in the field, you and I included, we all belong to him. So when you say, God, if you don't do it or else, what will it be? So this is the mentality and the mindset that you should have. That You should be having the mindset that you can even wait for God for a long time long time. And I want you to write down this scripture. I won't read it for you, but I want you to go look at it. Psalm 25 verse 5. Psalms 25. Read Psalms 5. Uh, 25 verse 5. Read that psalm. It tells you that you need to learn how to wait on God for a long time. A long time. If you're going to do any business with God, it cannot be a quick fix something. Sometimes we think that God acts like Father Christmas or Santa Claus. You know, you need him to come and fix quick something fast. The same way you can uh, fix a quick meal when you're hungry in the house. No, God does not deal or doesn't do business with us like that. Quick fixes. No, you must be prepared for a long time to engage with him. Sometimes you have to stay waiting without having a clue at all on what he is doing. Now remember, God is the one who called Abraham and he told Abraham, I'll show you. Come, I'll show you. I'll take you to your place. You can sacrifice to me. Abraham had no clue where God was taking him. You don't even have to know where God is taking you as long as it is him who told you that he's going to. You don't have to know. You don't have to have every detail, a detailed plan on what he's going to do. That on Monday, this is where we are going to do. On Tuesday, we will rest here. You don't have to have all these details. As long as you are dependent on God, you can wait on him. You can hope that what he has said. You'll bring it to pass. So one of the things that you must wait God with is, or how to wait God is that you must have that long time perspective in your heart. Number two, next thing you must do is to wait for God with patience, patience, patiently waiting, patiently waiting. Now, I want you to look at the Bible later, maybe, and I want you, but I don't want you to write it down and you can check it up later. Or when you are doing your Bible study. On Hebrews chapter 6 verse 15. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 15. The Bible talks about who through faith and patience obtained the promises. How Abraham waited patiently for God for more than 25 years. 25 years someone waiting on a promise that God had given out of his own volition. That must have been somebody who was really dependent on God. 
I also want you to, re, to, to, I also want to refer you to the book of James chapter 5 or 17. The Bible talks about consider how a farmer waits patiently for his crop. Now, when the Bible says consider, it is important for you actually to do exactly that and visit back into the days when you were raised in the village or in the countryside in the farm and begin to think how you used to plow and how you used to sow seeds into the soil and you had to wait for the rains to come and for the seeds to germinate. You had nothing to do with the germination. You just had to wait. A farmer cannot bring down the rain. He will wait for the fall former rain and the latter rain. He will wait for the crop to grow and there is nothing he can do when God is doing his work. He is the one who brings the increase and the growth. The farmer has nothing to do. He plows the land. He sows the seed into the soil and that's it. He waits. There are times you cannot do a thing about a situation and all what God wants you to do is to wait and not just wait. But wait patiently. You must learn how to wait patiently like a farmer. Read James chapter 5 verse 7 going forward. Must learn how to wait patiently on God. Number three on how you need to wait on God is you must be waiting on God and standing strong in faith. The Bible talks about in the book of Hebrews 10, who through faith and patience. Now, these are two things that go hand in hand. Now, sometimes Christians think that when you have faith, that things will happen like, you know, flipping in a switch, like it's going to happen like some magic. No, faith and patience go hand in hand. The people who obtained their promises, in fact, some of them even died without receiving the, the, the promises that they had. But they counted themselves blessed that God considered them to be partakers of his eternal kingdom. And they saluted his greatness and his grace upon their lives, even though they didn't see the promises manifest in their lives when they were alive. Some of the people were given promises that were to be fulfilled to the generations to come. But they believed God. They waited for, they waited with faith. So that thing you must have when you're waiting on God is faith. Now, if you wait for God to do something and you have no faith, really you are not waiting on God. You are not waiting. You are you are just you are just you are just idling. You are just you are just there. If you are going to wait for God to do things on your behalf or to do things with you or through you, you must have faith. You must have faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews 11:1. 1. Faith is the assurance. Do you have the assurance? That what God said he would do, that where God said he will take you, that where God said he will bring to you, that what God said he is going to bring about, you have assurance, you have faith in him that he will do it. That's the number three thing you must do when you're waiting on God. Number four is you must also learn to wait on God with eagerness with eagerness, with anticipation, with expectation, with a heart full of expectation. You must wait on God knowing that he would do it for he is not a liar. He is not a man that he should change his mind. He, whatever he says he will do, he does it. So you must wait for God with eagerness with eagerness, with eager expectation. And I want to give you several scriptures that I would like you to write down and you can look at, you can look them up later. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. Read also Romans chapter 8 verse 25. Also read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7 and Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. I will say them one more time. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 and Romans chapter 8 verse 25 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7 and then Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. On how to wait God for expectation. Expecting that he will do it. In expectation. Now, let me give you a story that shows you or try to paint in your mind what expectation is. With eagerness. What eagerness is all about. I will give you a true story of myself. Of something that happened to me. Literally, that happened to me. This is the story. When I was a young boy, and I think I was about, um, I was in class three at the time, I still remember clearly. I grew up in the countryside, like I think many of you know, I keep saying this. 
um, I was raised up in the countryside, and in the countryside, we only had those days, we only had public primary schools and secondary schools. We didn't have, uh, you know, secondary, uh, the private schools, academies, and all that. So everybody in the village went to the same school. Now, let me give you a little bit of history about me so that you understand something I want to relate to you. During those days, uh, it was... Uh, a crime is it a really that's not perhaps no it's a strong word to use but it was against the school rules to go to school in shoes why because many parents were poor so they couldn't afford shoes so the school had made a regulation that all children had to come to school minus shoes why because they didn't want the children who came from poor parents to feel as though they are, don't belong because it was a public school. So it was mandatory for all children to go to school bare feet. No shoes. No shoes at all. And anyway, even the parents who could afford shoes for their children were few. Maybe only the teachers. The rest of the children or the parents were just peace and farmers, they could not afford that. Shoes were a luxury that was not necessary at that time. So that's how we went to school. You had only one pair of shorts, one shirt, and one sweater. That's what you wore from Monday to Friday. You would wash it on Friday uh, when you get home in the evening, and they would dry it on Saturday. Sometimes uh, their parents, their, their children who didn't even have many clothes, they would still wear the same uniform over the weekend. Anyway, to cut the long story short, one day, one day when I was in class three, I had a class teacher and she was teaching us geography. I still remember her name. She passed on to be with the Lord. She was a wonderful woman of God who loved God and was teaching us Christianity as well. But she was teaching us geography in class three, I remember. And in one of our geography class, one day she came to class and said, children, good morning. Good morning, teacher. And she said, next week, uh, we are going to have a trip. And we were excited. You can imagine the rural village and you are told you are going to go on a trip. So we asked the teacher, Mrs. Hinga, where are we going for this trip? And she told us, next week, we will have a trip to Mombasa. Now, now, now. I don't know whether you can actually try and see the picture of a child in the village, in a remote part in the countryside. The teacher says we will go to Mombasa next week. Now, here is a big question for, for the teacher, from, our, for them, from the pupils. How shall we go? We are, are we required to pay money? How shall we go? The teacher explained to us and said, no, no one is asking you for any money. We have made arrangement for all of you that next week on Friday, we will be on our way to Mombasa. We will visit the port, uh, the port in Mombasa. We will see the Indian Ocean and many other places. I mean, we were excited. Class three pupils, can you imagine? We were excited. So we asked questions. So the teacher said, anybody with a question? Yes, one of my hand was among the ones that were up. And I said, teacher, so can we come in shoes? Uh, that day and she said yes you can now come in shoes you can borrow shoes from your neighbor i had no shoes myself i remember i borrowed shoes from my father i borrowed shoes from my father that he had abandoned for some time and i will put some makratas inside so that my tiny little legs can fit in and I also borrowed an iron box and I straightened up my clothes ready for this trip we were excited eagerly waiting to go to Mombasa the teacher had told us no payments are required. She had organized for the bus to take us to Mombasa. We are just going to have a fantastic time. And so she told us to be ready. She told us to alert our parents and all that. We were excited. You can imagine. So anyway, and I went home and I told my mother and my father that we were to go to Mombasa the following day. And they looked at me like, you know, I was a little crazy. They didn't know what to, <laughs> to think of what I was talking about. They were like, how? Even then they had not gone to Mombasa. So they were wondering, how, what is all this about? Anyway, and we couldn't stop talking about it, talking about it, excited about the day, looking forward. We were looking forward with expectation, excitement. You can imagine the excitement in the class. Now came the day we were supposed to go to Mombasa. We went to school earlier than normal time. We had clad ourselves with well straightened out uh, old uniform that we wore, with uh, shoes we had borrowed from our neighbors and all that. And we had even carried some bags, some bananas packed by our mothers and all that. Then we go to school and Mrs. Hinga is nowhere to be seen in the morning at all. And we are frustrated. Then Mrs. Hinga appears at around 10.30, uh, thereabout. 
10.30, I think, no, around 11 after the morning break, thereabout. I don't know whether it was 10.30 or 11, thereabout. So, Mrs. Hinga come, we see Mrs. Hinga coming, and we are excited. Hey! Here she comes, and she comes to class. And I uh, remember it was a class that was, uh, uh, they had no windows. It was just open spaces where the windows were supposed to be. There was just uh, an entrance. There was no door. So she came in. The floor was dusty. Actually, there was no floor. It was just a nothing floor, you know. We were excited. And when she came in, she came in carrying some books like this. And she, she told us, children, good morning. And we said, good morning. And she asked us, are you ready to go to Mombasa? We said, yeah. She said, the bus is ready. And she said, we were like, where? We haven't seen the bus. She said, the bus is ready. We are being waited for. And now it is time for us to get ready. And we were, you know, ready to get out. And she said, wait, hold on, hold on, guys. What I want you to do, I want you to lie, to put your hands on your desk. And I want you to lie there for like one minute. Put your head on your desk. And then I'll tell you what next to do. There we were, we obeyed. We put our hands on the desk. And after one minute, she said, okay, look up. And she said, take out your geography textbook. Go to page 27. I still remember the voice and the page and how the book looked. And page 27 on the geography textbook that those days for class three, it was talking about the port of Mombasa. And she said, here we are now in Mombasa. And you can imagine the frustration and the disappointment that we had. No wonder I still remember that story more than 40 years later. Now, why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story to try and paint for you that when you're waiting for God with eagerness and expectation, you look forward to it. You are eager. You are looking forward. You have no doubt in your mind that what God said, well, he will do, he will do it. You wait for it with eagerness. Some people don't receive from God because you don't wait. You don't wait with expectation. You don't expect that God will do it. Haven't we seen in the Bible when Jesus wanted to cure some people of sicknesses and ailments, he would tell them, believe, believe. He would tell them, according to your faith, if you don't expect that you'll be healed, he wouldn't heal you. Now, 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 here is a question as I come to close. Why do some people grow impatient? Why do people grow impatient in the process of waiting on God? And I'll tell you why people grow impatient. And it is in the book of Psalms 37 verse 7. It talks about, I looked at the wicked and I saw how prosperous they were or seemed to be. And I considered my state and I became impatient. When you begin to look at others, God is not dealing with you the way he is dealing with other people. No, he is dealing with you as you. God is a father. He knows his children. He knows who needs what time to learn something. He will walk you through this journey alone by yourself. Don't try to compare yourself. So and so finally they got a house. And I even hear people, even people have changed the meaning of what? I can't wait to have a home. Then when, how will you have a home if you cannot wait? I can't wait to get married. Then how will you get married if you cannot wait to get married? I can't wait to have children. How will you get children if you cannot wait to have children? I can't wait to do this. You have to learn how to wait. Waiting is a Christian discipline. And you're not put on waiting because you have done something wrong. No, sometimes you just have to grow up. Sometimes you have just to mature up. Sometimes you are not yet ready. Sometimes God wants you to grow up. So don't try to compare yourself with other people. So wait for God. And when you have waited patiently, looking forward, depending on him, when the appointed time comes, the Lord will turn things around in your favor. He will turn the captivity. And I want you to know, doesn't, know, doesn't matter how long you have waited. So maybe you're asking me, Stephen, how long do I have to wait? Until you see the promise. How long does it take for me to see the promise? Until you have waited that you are for, the, for the duration of time that you are required to wait. So wait on God. Don't be in a hurry to do business with God. God is not Santa Claus. God is God. He is a father. He is concerned about every detail of your life. So much so that even know how many hair strands you have on your head. And the Bible says, 
He, the Bible actually says they are numbered. That means God knows which strad is number what. Which one is number 10? Which one is number 21? God, he is that concerned about your details. There's nothing about you that God is not aware. Maybe you've waited too long to get a job and you're like, oh, I've waited too long. How long is too long? There's nothing like too long. You just need to wait. Grow. Wait on God, depend on God, rely on God. When you do that, when God does it for you, you can never say it's my tall anchor or it's because of my qualification or the other. No, you will say, I waited on God and he came through for me. Maybe you're waiting to get married, waiting to find a spouse or to have children. How long do you have to wait? Just wait. As long as you're walking in faithfulness and waiting on God, wait in faith, in expectation. And believe that God who promised will bring it to pass. I want to say thank you for staying with me. Like I promised you, this was a quick word. I just wanted to download it to you. And I hope and I believe that God has spoken to your heart. And that this word has encouraged you. So thank you so much. I would ask of you kindly, if you can, even after this, you can share this live broadcast on the social media platform. You can also create watch parties, invite your friends to watch along with you. And I hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. I've been your host, Pastor Steve Kegwa. God bless you. Have yourself a fantastic weekend. See you next Saturday. God willing. God bless.